it's summertime still. And Wendy and I are leaving on a vacation today for Cape Breton Island. Isn't that wonderful? We're really excited. Uh, we would ask for your prayers in our travels, but more important than traveling mercies, uh, which is, should always be our cases, we, we pray that you, we would ask that you'd ask, you'd pray for us uh, that we would go in the strength of the Lord. Because you know what? Whether we're on vacation or not, we're always in a spiritual battle. And sometimes when we're not in the routine of life, that's when we're most susceptible. And so we often will pray for people that are traveling and we try, pray for their safety in the travels, but maybe we should really be praying more for their spiritual welfare as they're doing something that's not normal for them and they may uh, drift away being on vacation. We never want to be on vacation from God, right? Sometimes we're very much aware of this spiritual battle that we're in. Our struggle with evil. But other times we're not maybe fully engaged. And I suspect that you would agree to me with me that it's when those times that we're not specifically engaged that we're actually probably at greatest risk of the attacks of the devil. Uh, years ago, uh, Shirley Straker created a uh, prayer warrior list. Anybody remember that prayer warrior list for the, the uh, missionaries that we support in, in Japan? Anybody in here, here on that list? Were you on that list? Some, I know there's, the whole list was full, so somebody had to be on it, right? I, re I remember I was on uh, the 7th of the month I was supposed to pray, and when he was on the 11th, it's easy to remember 7 and 11, right? And I didn't always necessarily remember on the seventh for whatever reason, because it's like if, if it's only once a month, if it's something. But the reality is, we should be praying all the time. It shouldn't just like be, well, once a month I'm going to pray for this work. And whether you were on that prayer warrior list or not, let me suggest to you that every one of us in Christ Jesus are meant to be prayer warriors. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he, he, the 12 gathered around and didn't say, okay, so I'm going to teach you to pray, uh, but, you know, Peter and John, you need to really pay attention because your gift is prayer. The rest of you, well, you know, that wasn't the case. He taught them all to pray. And, in fact, that is the mission of everybody within the church, this, this, this idea of praying all the time. Uh, we're all in a spiritual battle. We're all supposed to put on the whole armor of God. We've been talking about uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20 is the whole passage. And this is our last uh, go-around as far as the spiritual battle. This doesn't mean we're not going to be in a spiritual battle from now on, obviously, but this is it for this sermon series uh, today. And so uh, just as much as every one of us is, uh, a, is a, in a spiritual battle and we're all warriors in this, this fight, we're also all prayer warriors. But let me go ahead and read... Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 again for the last time as a community at this time and then we'll focus in on this idea of prayer finally tell, Paul tells them and he tells us he says finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel 
for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Today, as we conclude this Armor of God series, we're going to concentrate on prayer, and we're going to draw our points from one verse, verse 18. Ephesians 6, 18. So afterwards, if you didn't write down all the points, you can just read that verse and see all five points that I'm going to write, say, okay. Notice Paul doesn't call prayer a weapon. But in putting on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes that represent the readiness that the gospel of peace gives us, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, in putting on the whole armor of God, he says, putting on the whole armor of God, verse 18, pray at all times in the Spirit. In all this armor that we're putting on, prayer is a part of that process. We are in a spiritual battle. We well, are Christians. Every one of us, if we are a believer in Christ, we are also a prayer warrior. We recognize we're in a battle, and sometimes we maybe forget, but we, we need to keep focused on that. And as we keep focused on that, all the armor that we're putting on, that's all soaked in prayer. Praying at all times in the Spirit. In fact, I suggest to you that a prayer may be a little bit like breathing. It's kind of essential. Last week we talked about uh, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, right? And how we use that in uh, defending ourselves against the attacks of the devil. And you might remember in Matthew chapter 4 how Jesus was attacked by the devil. And the devil comes up to him and he, and he, 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 he confronts Jesus and, and suggests that he turns stones into bread. And what does Jesus say? Anybody know the very first words that Jesus says? It is written. He says, it is written. But doesn't the devil get a good, make a good point? Well, yeah, yeah, but Jesus, you know, like, you're hungry. You've been fasting for 40 days. Was it really going to hurt us? Like, who's going to get hurt? Like, what's the big deal if you just turn stones into bread? No, Satan. My life is according to the word of God. A man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In another place, Jesus says to his disciples, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. If we can understand that the word of God is so essential to our spiritual living that it's like food to our souls, then can we not say that also prayer is kind of like breathing? Without it, we will die. In this particular case, it says pray at all times. I'm sure you know some other passages like that. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, anybody? Pray without ceasing. Romans 12.12, anybody? Be constant in prayer. So this kind of idea of praying at all times, in every place, without ceasing, constantly in prayer, it's kind of akin to the fact that, you know, if this is how essential this is to our life, it's kind of like breathing. Our first point from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 is this. In Christ, I am a prayer warrior who makes plans to engage in prayer at all times. Kind of like breathing. So do you pray at all times? Well, maybe there's a little bit of a caveat here in that maybe praying isn't quite like breathing because we, uh, you know, most of us, we don't have to think about breathing to breathe. We just do, right? Wow, wouldn't it be great if our prayer life was like that? Where it became so much a part of our lives that we didn't actually have to think about it, just it was what was? But in a sense, I, I, I believe that really there's a certain intentionality that is required. And so the idea that this is like breathing is the fact that just like breathing is essential to living, prayer is essential to our spiritual growth in Christ Jesus. We need, to, we need it to live and to grow. We need to be intentional about this. So we need to make plans to be uh, always breathing, always uh, praying to God. 
I mentioned earlier that uh, Wen and I are going on vacation. We didn't wake up this morning and say, hey, you know what, let's go on vacation today. We uh, made plans. Now, it's not, it's true, we can do some things we can do spontaneously, but I suspect that you don't do everything in your life spontaneously. You make plans. Oh, uh, what's your dinner plans for tonight? Oh, oh we, well, we've made plans. There's this concept that we always are making plans, and if we don't make plans as far as our prayer life is concerned, then how important is our prayer life? Make specific times. Just dedicate for prayer. Do you do that? Maybe uh, have a prayer partner, and, and what you're going to do is you're going to get together specifically once a week. We're going to get together, and what's the purpose of our getting together? Is it to talk about the weather and the Blue Jays and the what? No, it's to pray. Doesn't mean you can't do other things, but the priority there is prayer. Set aside certain times, set aside certain accountability partners where prayer is what happens so that there's, there's this idea of making plans that prayer is going to be a, a regular part, a regular routine in my life. We pray at all times. When you're tempted, pray to God to overcome that temptation. When you see injustice, pray to God that he makes it right. When you meet someone that needs Christ, pray to God that they can come to know Christ and pray to God that you can have, be a, have the courage to share Christ with them. When you feel down, pray to God. When you've been blessed, give thanksgiving to God. When you think of the church of Christ in this place, pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. When others mistreat you, pray for them and pray for your attitude about them that you can have the compassion of Christ within your heart even though they've not wronged you to return love to them instead. Pray at all times. But I suggest that this idea of praying at all times, there's a certain intentionality that has to take, there, has to take place there. And so we need to make plans to engage in prayer at all times. As we continue in the text, the next point would lead us to say, uh, in Christ, I'm a prayer warrior who is praying at all times. What does it say next? In the Spirit. In the Spirit. Which means I'm depending on the Spirit's power as I pray. The Spirit actually intercedes for us, right? I'm submitting to His will, and I'm enjoying fellowship with God, fellowship with the Spirit of God. Oftentimes, we don't even know what to pray for. Um, we know that prayer is good for us. We know that we should be praying to God. That's about a right relationship with God. We, we get some of that, but we don't even know what we should say or how to say it. But the Spirit helps us, doesn't it? Romans 8, 26 and 27, you know this one, right? It says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes according to the will of God. The whole purpose of prayer is not for me to get what I want or for you to get what you want. Sure, in a sense, uh, that we could say, we could make an argument that that's the case, because after all, Jesus, when he's talking about the vine and the branches, he says, uh, if you ask anything in my name, you know, you're going to get it. He says, he says this, he says, um, if, I ab if Jesus abides in us, and his words abide in you, if, if his words abide in us, he says, well, ask whatever you want, whatever you want and it'll be yours. Say, so oh, see, it's about me. It's whatever I want. No, no, wait a sec. What does it say? Actually, it's about whatever Jesus wants. And so there's this concept that, you know, we, we, we can ask for what we want, as long, assuming that what we want is what Jesus wants. To pray in the Spirit is to have this, this oneness, this, this fellowship, this bonding, this submission to the will of God in our lives to have this close relationship with God, to rejoice that he's at work in us. Our third point from Ephesians chapter 6 is this. In Christ, I am 
a prayer warrior who is praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. With all prayer and supplication. In other words, there's nothing too great and nothing too small that we can't bring before God our Father. The devil would have you and I believe that certain things we uh, should just keep to ourselves. You know? God, you don't need to really in involve God in that. Like, that's, that's, a, that's too small. Don't worry about it. Just, you know, do you do, just deal with that on your own. Or, oh, well, that's really big. But, you, know, that's, you better... The devil wants to mess around with our minds and suggest to us that we don't have this close relationship with God where we can just share everything with him. But because of Christ Jesus in your life and mine, there's this idea that we have this relationship with God that is the closest relationship that we have with anybody at all. And we can share absolutely everything with him. Jesus Christ is not meant to be Lord of part of your life or you know, this part and that part. He's meant to be Lord of our whole life, right? Lord of all. Paul uses the words prayer and supplication in this case. Prayer is certainly this idea of just general praying to God, but supplication is more the concept of specific requests that we make to God. And so we pray all the time in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, meaning, you know, whether it's general or whether it's specific. We pray in community and we pray in private. We pray with loud cries and we pray with low whispers. We pray in times that are set times. We set aside this time and we pray spontaneously. We pray with holy hands lifted high and we pray on our knees. We pray with eyes lifted to heaven and we pray with our face on the ground. We pray imitating our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who felt the need. He was God himself, but he felt the need to pray to God because it's about relationship with the Father. In John chapter 17, you remember Jesus praying. What's that about? What's the prayer about in John 17? Anybody? Somebody? Please. Yeah, it's about believers. Sometimes it's called the believer's prayer. That Jesus did this. This is a prayer for believers. The entire chapter, and it says, starts off with, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he prayed for you and I. But then a very short while later, what do we have? Jesus in Gethsemane. And where are his eyes at that point, does it seem like? It says his face is on the ground. Because in that particular case now, like he's just pouring out his emotions, his feelings to God because there's nothing too great, there's nothing too small that can't become before God, whether we're lifting it up high in praise to God and thanksgiving to God or whether we're in humble humility and we're in despair and we're on the ground. Whatever the case, everything can come before God our Father who loves us and cares for us. Well, even those minor things. Oh, Kevin, yeah, I don't know about minor things. Like, you know... We're picking the color for, to paint the kitchen. I don't think we need to pray to God about that. And maybe you don't need to pray to God about that. Say, well, what am I going to cook for dinner? I don't need to talk to God about that. Well, you know, maybe you don't need to talk to God about that. But let me ask you this. When some of these minor decisions of life, would you talk to your spouse about it? Certain minor decisions in life, would you talk to your friends about certain things? That, they're not really big decisions, but it's just, you know, would you talk to them? What's the priority relationship in your life? Do you not think that maybe God, our Father, who loves us so much, wants to hear even about the little tiny things in our life? That he welcomes us sharing with him? Even about a paint color? But it's not about the paint color. It's not about the minusculity or the smallness. It's about the relationship. It's about the openness to share everything with God our Father. He already knows everything about us, but to, to share everything with Him. He is our loving Father, and He is our friend. The next point from our verse is this. He starts a new sentence, so I start a little bit different here. In Christ, I am a prayer warrior who keeps alert with all perseverance in prayer. He says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. That's in the verse. Keep alert. 
And we recognize that we're in a spiritual war here. And we probably recognize that, you know, in a battle, if there's a battle going on, there's somebody that's a lookout. There's a sentry that's watching for the enemy, right? They don't, you know, just, okay, we're all just going to go to sleep. And, you know, if the enemy happens to, if anybody hears anything when they're asleep, no, no, there's somebody watching. There's somebody keeping watch. You remember Jesus in Gethsemane? What does he say to his disciples? Yeah, watch and pray. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. In other words, you know what? Never let your guard down. In Luke 18, Jesus told the parable of a persistent widow in order uh, to teach us to keep on praying and never give up, it says. That persistent widow, she was suffering injustice, but she did not give up. She just kept on coming. She kept on coming until she got an answer. So as prayer warriors, we too must watch and pray. We need to keep alert. We need to not let our guard down. We need to persevere in prayer until we have an answer. Now, God doesn't always give us the answer we want, does he? But he gives us what's according to his will and gives us what is best for us. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, right? We see a great example. I'm glad this example is in the Bible where Paul, it says he prays for this thorn in the spirit. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh. We don't know what this thorn in the flesh was. There's lots of controversy about that, but I suspect that everyone else would, would agree that, you know what, Paul actually kind of wanted that to be the result, that the, he would pray for that and God would take it away. But that's not the answer he got, did he? Instead of what he was hoping would happen in prayer, he, he prays, and he prays three times, but he recognizes after the third time that God is giving him an answer, and the answer is this, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. So God doesn't always give us what we want, but he gives us what's best. He, and we need to keep alert. We need to keep working. We need to pe keep being persistent in prayer and trust that God will give us the answer that's right, that's best. Our fifth point from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 is this. In Christ, I am a prayer warrior who keeps alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. In other places, Paul commands us to pray for unbelievers and governor rulers. We heard that in our reading this morning from 1 Timothy 2, right? But in this case, he specifically talks about the brotherhood, our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's an essential element of us growing together as the body of Christ, growing and building each other up in love, that we pray for one another. Yes, it's right for me to pray for me, and yes, it's right for you to pray for you. And yes, it's right for us to pray for our physical needs. But would you not agree it's more important for us to pray for our spiritual needs? And maybe in the same way, it's more important that we actually pray for others and not just ourselves. In the last few verses, pray, uh, Paul is not opening up in prayer about himself. He's saying, I, I, I ask for your prayers for me. And throughout Paul's writings, we see him uh, offering up prayers and, and suggesting that we pray for various people, other people, and also asking other people to pray for him. Because there's this idea that this idea of praying for one another, that's a part of who we are as Christ's church. That my prayer life isn't about 80% about me and, uh, you know, the general world around me and then a little bit about my brothers and sisters. No! The biggest part of my prayer life is about my brothers and sisters in Christ and my relationship with God and making that right and praying for the lost. It's outside of myself. You know what happens if my prayer life is all about me all the time? That is what? Where's the focus? The focus is in me. And it's not that... I'm saying that it's wrong for us to pray for ourselves. Uh, sure, you know, you're, you're struggling in prayer. Jesus prays 
for himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. But the majority of our prayer, I think, should really be outward focus. When we pray for ourselves, the focus, if that's all that we ever do, then we're all focusing on ourselves, and it becomes self-interest. And what I suggest happens is, instead of us actually overcoming and, and having a solution to the whatever, even if it's a spiritual thing that we're struggling with, and we're always praying to God about that, the thing is, if it's always about the problem, my problem, we're missing the blessings that God has as in sharing and asking others to pray for us and praying for other people. Instead of an inward focus, we need to be an outward focus. We need to be more like Jesus Christ who humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's this attitude of considering others more important than myself. That's what we see in Christ Jesus. To have his attitude is to have that attitude where others are more important and I'm willing to humble myself in love for my brothers and sisters in Christ. James talks about this idea of the, the prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. And just before that, he's saying, he's saying that in relation to us praying for one another. And so as Paul, in the end of this verse, says, making supplication for all the saints, it's this idea that we're, it's an outward focus. It's for the, the, the body of Christ. And this is so valuable. Now, this isn't to diminish your struggles, but the reality is we're not meant to live in a little bubble or in some dark hole somewhere alone all by ourselves. That's not God's plan. That's not called church. And Jesus Christ established a church, which he is ahead of, and we're all a part of that body. And we're to build each other up in love and to pray for one another. I encourage you, Read through our text that we've been looking at throughout this summer about putting on the whole armor of God. Recognize that we are in a spiritual battle and we can't just sort of like lay back and take it easy and think, oh yeah, well, you know, I'll be engaged when I, if I feel it. It's not about feeling it. It's about waking up every day and recognize that I need to put on my whole armor. And I'm going to put on my whole armor praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, I'm going to keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Amen? Won't you pray with me? Lord God, you know all of our hearts. And we do want to have a closer relationship with us, with you, Lord, and, and with each other. And Father, we pray that you will, you will strengthen us by the power of your Spirit, that we can rely on you, depend on you, be willing to share everything with you, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters in this place right now that your love may prevail, that unity may prevail, that we'll have a care and compassion for one another in keeping with the mind and the attitude of Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, we are so grateful for your love. We thank you so much that you've made us your very own children. Help us to live in a manner that is worthy of that calling that we have. Father, we pray for your church in this place. We pray for your church in the entire world. Lord, we pray that you may be glorified in us. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.